Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I offer one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com where you can also sign up for my mailing list. I also post daily on Facebook, so there are lots of ways that we can connect. But for now, the angels and I, we are here to co-create a beautiful sacred space where you can rest and replenish and fall asleep if that is your desire. I say that because I know many of you listen during your waking hours. So however you are listening, whenever it is in your cycle of your day or night, I welcome you. And I'm grateful to have this time together. So this podcast is a creation of love. I am someone who listens to sleep podcasts every night and I connect with the angels all the time. So this podcast is a blend of two of my favorite forms of self care. I'm someone who loves bedtime. I love getting to go to bed at the end of the day. I don't know. There's something so delicious about crawling into bed and fluffing up the pillows and having permission to complete the day. I don't know who the permission is from. (laughs) Just just how it's coming forward. It's like, okay, I've done enough for the day. I can, I can drift off now. And I just, I love that moment. And so this podcast is one that is designed to bring you love. Whenever you listen, And also, if you happen to listen right before you drift off, it's a way to infuse that moment and your consciousness with a lot of love and kindness and compassion for you. So I'm grateful to be here with you. And for those of you who are regular listeners, you will notice that I have been publishing more replays than usual. And I I don't really have a good reason for it. You know, I wish I could say it's I've been on a phenomenal vacation or writing my book or uh, it's just been normal life. (laughs) And I don't know, I'm kind of drifting in a good way. I'm drifty. Can drifty be an adjective? I'm drifty. I wake up in the morning and I putter and I journal and I get lost on the internet and I have it in my mind that my favorite time to record these episodes is if I start at about 6.15 in the morning, 6.30 at the latest. And so if I happen to putter and I look up and it's a quarter to seven, I'm like, oh, it's too late. Okay. Okay. It's just a made-up rule. I, you know, it's not that anybody else has has <laughs> made this a rule than me. But there's something about the early mornings that I treasure. And if I start recording early enough, the world isn't noisy yet. So I'm happy to say this morning I started recording this right before 6.30. I was about to go down a rabbit hole on the internet on something completely inconsequential. 
And I looked at the clock out of the corner of my eye and I was like, girl, get in front of the microphone now. (laughs) So here I am. And if a few more replays start showing up, just know it's all good. I'm good. I'm just drifty. (laughs) Isn't that a good word? Yeah, maybe you're drifty too. It's so interesting because in the end of January and February and March, I was just so excited and moving forward and creating a print on demand store. And I still am going to do it. But somewhere around the time I started posting replays, my motivation just kind of drifted off. So, so I've been drifting and it's okay. I think we experience seasons, you know, different waves of energy come to us and I've learned to surrender to them because I also know the energy will return soon and I will be enthusiastically participating in things like this podcast and my print on demand store and other creative endeavors that I have. It feels as if this is a time for acclimating, not a good word, acclimating to what is. I think there are a lot of changes that we're moving through collectively and personally. And I think in some ways we are positioning ourselves or getting positioned. There is an attunement happening. There used to be just the, the most wonderful woman, Karen Bishop. She used to write a website called What's Up on Planet Earth. And I first started reading her back in around, in somewhere around 2000. And she wrote pretty regularly through 2012 and then periodically up through about 2015. And she wrote about ascension and the energies of the moment. And I loved her work so much because what she would write about would wind up being what I was experiencing. I mean, I wouldn't experience it because she wrote about it. I mean, I would be having these symptoms and then I would pull up her blog and I would read exactly what I was going through. So I have this sense if she were still writing, she would be writing about this time of perhaps feeling like we're in the clouds. We're in between realms. We're in between breaths. There's a beautiful Osho Zen tarot card that if you have taken classes with me, you will have heard me talk about before. It is the no thingness card. It's the word no dash thingness, no thingness. And it's an all black card, which at first glance might seem ominous, but it's not. The card represents that stillness, that moment between breaths or that pause just before a new universe is created. And that's what this time feels like to me. It's like I'm, I'm in a pause. You might feel like you're in a pause too. If you're not, keep going. But these moments of stillness, drifting, acclimating, where something energetic is happening, but I don't know what it is. I don't feel, even though I'm using the word drifty, I don't feel adrift because that's a different descriptor. I don't feel that at all. I feel like I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I'm just floating on a current and the current is moving with purpose even if I don't know what the purpose is. I wish I could, I could speak of this more eloquently, <laughs> but I'm trying to describe this because you might be feeling it too. 
It's one of the things I loved so much about Karen Bishop is that she normalized this. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's what's going on. And so maybe somehow I'm describing an experience you're having, no matter when you listen to this, if you're listening to this three years from now, maybe you're listening to it during a time that you're feeling this way as well. Because we all go through these cycles. And one of the things that doing this work has helped me understand is there are times that I get to be the driver and the cosmic soup of the world works in my favor. I can get a lot of things done. There's lots of new beginnings. I feel a beautiful sense of vitality and engagement. And then there are times that I'm just ready to put my feet up and it feels much harder to show up in the doing. So I've, I've learned to just surrender to it because there are things in motion that I perhaps am not comprehending with my personality consciousness. It's a moment by moment thing. So I have to say I'm so happy to be in front of the microphone right now and getting to send you this missive of love <laughs> to wherever you are right now. And usually as I go through things like this, someone, whether it's my husband or a friend or someone in one of my classes might say, what do the angels have to say about this? Great question. Almost always. Well, let's ask them. Hold on. Give me a minute. They're here. Of course they're here. So let's ask. I'm not going to channel. I'm just going to have a conversation inside my consciousness. So I'm going to ask the angels, what, what can you tell us about this moment that we are in? And I can feel the angels helping me take a deep breath in. So you take a deep breath in as well. So here's what they say. Whether it is visible to you or not. There are many shifts and changes taking place right now. Some of them will not be visible or known for many months, but the motion is already in place. And for those of you who feel this invitation to unplug or rest, or maybe you feel like you have no choice other than to do just that, it is because it is the most graceful way to prepare you for acclimating to the updated energies that will be in flow. And the angels are saying, we, we understand this sounds very mysterious, but it is actually something that happens all the time. It's just that as we become more aware of our own instrument, these moments become more visible to us. So many things are in motion. And sometimes perception of this stillness or floating energy is actually in service to help you more rapidly move with the new energies. So 
have faith in this moment that you are being loved and guided and supported. You are a finely tuned energetic instrument and you are being cared for. And the angels say, you know, give your worries to us. We will take care of you and we will take care of those things that are of concern to you. And, and I haven't officially called the angels in. They're already here. But let's just do a little prayer together. So beautiful angels on high, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for infusing this broadcast with waves of love and healing and light and goodness. I ask that you send these blessings of love to everyone who is listening to everyone that they love and to everyone that loves them, creating a beautiful ripple of love that moves beyond time and space. So dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in and I'll ask the angels if there's anything else they want us to know about this time we are in. They bring forward the reminder that as they said before, we are finely honed instruments. And just as birds and other creatures know the cycles of migration, when to prepare for winter, when to become more active in the summer, the deep knowingness that comes with an intuitive understanding of the moment of time you are in, that knowingness also dwells within us, dwells within you and me. And so when you feel guided to slow down, do not judge. You know, somehow mankind has decided that we are to be in 24-7 productive cycles and that we only rest when we need to. We only rest when the clock tells us it is time or the calendar says it is time. But the, the instruments that we are, they are not guided by external measures of calendars and clocks. They function independently. We feel the phases of the moon. We feel the changes in barometric pressure. And we feel the powerful waves of energy that are co-created and manifested through the collective in this realm and beyond. And so please do not judge that you are lost or behind schedule or out of chances. Sometimes the trees become still. And when the trees become still, they do not ever question if they will have the rustling of their leaves and branches again. They know that will happen. Not in the way you know things, but trees are in harmony with the energies around them. Or to use that as a metaphor. Right now, as I'm recording this, I'm staring out the window and the trees are still. Fairly soon there will be a breeze that moves them or the neighborhood squirrels will be running through their branches and I'll get to watch them do gymnastics. But for right now, in the early morning, it is still. And I am feeling this stillness. And because this is a sleep podcast, I send the stillness to you as well. 
in hopes that it will help you drift off to sleep. So my beautiful friends, just take some nice deep breaths in and out. Just letting this loving presence be with you as you settle in to this beautiful body of yours. Settling into the thoughts in your mind and the emotions in your heart. Bringing this love to all that you are to all parts of consciousness, to all parts of your body and your emotional being. And your angels are surrounding the place you are in with beautiful love. And so, we welcome you into a good sleep. Unless you're operating heavy machinery and it is the middle of your day. In which case, we wish you perfect alertness for whatever you are doing. So you pick which one you need right now. If it is your bedtime, we wish you sleep. If you are requiring a level of functionality, we wish you perfect alertness for whatever you are doing. And so, my friends, we are going to move on over into story time. I love you. I'm so happy to be here with you right now. There's a lot of sacred energy and flow. I hope you can feel it. I am. And so, I'm going to take a breath with you, and we'll start our story time. So, for story time, I'm guided to read from a travel log that was written in 1910 about Yellowstone Park. And it's from the Burton Holmes travelogues. And I downloaded this quite a long time ago, but I seem to recall that this was a, a publisher that published a lot of travel logs back in the day. So, you know, this was the time before we had, you know, lots of movies and television and you know, now, well, first off, Yellowstone is a huge series, which I haven't watched. I think it's a little too violent for me, but, you know, now it's easy to go and see pictures of Yellowstone and, you know, there's people on Instagram and YouTube and you go with them as they park their camper van and, you know, go on these adventures. And, and just so you know, I love that stuff. I don't like to travel myself. Perhaps I have shared with you that I have developed some mild travel anxiety <laughs> in my later years here where it's not that, that um, I'm afraid. It's just I love my home. I love that everything is where I want it to be and need it to be. And I love my bed and I love my couch and I love my home. And so I don't want to be away from it overnight. Like, if I'm happy to go on a day trip somewhere, I just want to wind up back in my bed at the end of the day. And I love watching other people go on travel adventures. I was just watching a TikTok about this guy on a top of a mountain with his dog, like a border collie. And it was blizzarding. And his tent... You know, he was prepared for this. He, this wasn't a, a mistake. He, this, he Clearly, he knows what he's doing. And, you know, his tent is getting covered up with snow, and he's talking about what he needs to do to stay safe. And, and then he gets in the tent and curls up with his dog. And I think, God bless him. I love that I get to watch this vicariously, because never in a gazillion years would that be me. I don't even want to drive to the grocery store when it's raining. <laughs> like, I would never think I'm going to go to the top of the mountain and be in a tiny tent in a blizzard. Like, nothing about that sounds good to me, but for sure I will watch someone else do that. Or if you've ever watched shows like Survivor or Naked and Afraid, I always laugh. I'm like, I would last... 30 seconds. First off, they would never pick me. But 30 seconds in, I'd say to the camera person, give me your granola bar. I'm going home. I'm done. There's a bug. I'm out. So 
okay, back to this idea of travel logs, this would be the 1910 version of, you know, watching someone else go on an adventure that you might not ever go on. I'm sure most of the people that were reading this travel log were never going to make it to Yellowstone. I've never been. Not, not that I'm the, not that I'm the, you know, the poster child for where you should have traveled <laughs> in your life. But I'm just saying, I've never been to Yellowstone. My only experience of Yellowstone is through other people's eyes. And so this is what that would have been like if we were existing in the early 1900s. I don't know. Does that even make sense what I just said? It's a sleep podcast. So again, the bar's pretty low for my ramblings to make sense. But that's what I got right now. You know, I, back then, I would have probably eaten up travel logs. Like someone else is going to go to Tibet because I would never go. And someone else would go to Yellowstone. Because probably for me, being on a train for 10 days would not have sounded good. <laughs> so I just honor those who travel and film or write, and then I don't have to. So let's get into it. Let's go on an adventure to Yellowstone. Okay, and I, I do have to give a little disclaimer here. One of the challenges about reading things that were written back in the early 1900s or late 1800s is that more often than not, they are written by white men through a very colonial perspective. And I do my best to take out the pieces that are very offensive. So... I, I just wanted to tell you that. So we start off by saying the Yellowstone National Park, the Yellowstone region, that semi-mythical wonderland of yesterday, has become a fascinating reality to the traveler of today. Late in the 60s, so they would be talking about the 1860s, the attention of the world was directed to an unexplored region in the northwestern corner of Wyoming. I'm sorry, it's early, and I just have to say, unexplored by white people, <laughs> by white European people. Um, I, I, I'm not going to do this the whole time, I promise. I just, you know, it, it absolutely was explored, just not by anyone who was a white European. Okay, I'll keep going now. An unexplored region in the northwestern corner of Wyoming. Strange rumors had been set afloat concerning the existence there among the Rockies near the headwaters of a river called the Yellowstone of an almost inaccessible plateau where mysterious phenomena of a most startling character were grouped as in an enchanted amphitheater. So we're going to start here where the author is talking about how you get to Yellowstone. And he, I'm sure it's a he, he writes, My task is therefore not an easy one, since it is to describe the indescribable. Returning in August from Greece to the United States, I was dreading the long midsummer railway ride over fully two-thirds of our broad continent. But a friend said, Why do you go by rail? Why don't you travel west by water? The thought was new to me. And I at once resolved to take advantage of that splendid waterway which leads from the Empire State to the gates of the Great Northwest. Accordingly, the porter is given instructions to pat us off at Buffalo, where we begin our long voyage around America's vast inland seas. Well worthy the name of seas are the waters traversed by the great snow-white Levanthian, the Northland. From New York State to Minnesota, the traveler may speed in a luxurious steamer almost at a railway pace. 
of the most delightful voyage through Erie, Huron, and Superior, I shall say little. Exhilarating as are the fresh lake winds, and lovely as is the expanse of water over which we speed, the winds and waters do not lend themselves to illustration, but among the few events that call for pictorial record is the arrival at the gay summer port of Mackinac, reached on the second morning. The summer colony turns out in force to welcome us. Newspapers, which are brought on board, tell us that throughout the length and breadth of the land, there is intense August heat. I'm just going to tell you that part, but people are having a lot of difficulty from the intense August heat. With selfish pleasure, we recall two days of fresh, cool breezes and thank our stars that we have wisely chosen to travel west by the water route. On the pier, we find a happy crowd of people whose only object in life is to keep cool and to enjoy themselves. Many of our fellow passengers leave the ship at Mackinac, but their places are taken by others who embark for an excursion to the famous Sioux, the gateway to Lake Superior. So when they're talking about Mackinac, I'm pretty sure they're talking about Mackinac Island, which is in Michigan, right? Am I right about that? Apologies. I think it's Michigan. And it's a very famous resort. So, and, and, and on TikTok, there are some lovely creators who live on Mackinac Island year round. One of them owns her family's fudge shop, her, their candy shop, which has been in her family for generations, I think. Maybe it was her grandfather, which would be multiple generations. And she makes fudge on Mackinac Island. Now, I've never been to Mackinac Island, but I love watching this woman ride her bike around the island and make fudge. Delights me. And if you've ever seen the movie Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour, is it Jane Seymour? Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Yes, I think it's Jane Seymour, right? Somewhere in Time was filled on Mackinac Island. Just a, just a little trivia for you here. Unless they are not speaking of Mackinac Island, in which case it's still interesting. But we'll go back to our traveler here, our intrepid traveler. So we reach the Sioux, or Lake Superior, or properly the city of Sault Ste. Marie in the late afternoon. The Northland glides into a splendidly constructed lock. The lower gates are closed and suddenly the water at the upper begins to act as if a geyser were striving to break forth, and slowly, steadily, lightly, as if instead of solid steel she were made but of snowy paper, the Northland rises eighteen feet, then pauses a moment, before steaming northward upon the bosom of Superior, to whose level she has been lifted so quietly and without appreciable delay. Have you ever been in a boat when it's gone through the locks? I, I can't remember where this would have taken place, but I've, I've been on a boat like that several times as a child. So somewhere in the Chicago Midwest area, we had done travels where the boat goes into the locks and then the water level changes, and then you continue on your way. So a little childhood memory here. We now enjoy a night and a day on the clear, deep waters of our greatest lake, and finally, three days after our departure from Buffalo, we reach Duluth. Thence by rail, we hasten to the Twin Cities, arriving just in time to join friends with whom we are to travel to the Yellowstone. Westward, we are then whirled over the line of the Northern Pacific Railway, across Dakota and Montana through the Badlands, along the lower course of the Yellowstone River, to the little town of Cinnabar, on the border of the park, beyond which Uncle Sam will not permit the iron horse to pass. There are, however, other horses, and excellent ones too, awaiting us. A four-in-hand coach has been provided for our party, 
and in it we are soon installed with bags and cameras, umbrellas, linen dusters, and a wealth of expectation. We give the signal for our departure, a crack of the whip, a forward spring of the four horses, and we receive the first impression of a visit to the Yellowstone. It's interesting that they keep calling it the Yellowstone. Nowadays, we just call it Yellowstone. We dropped the the, but we'll keep going. It is this. In the foreground, the backs of the four tugging horses, on either side, a mass of scrubby pines. Before us, a dusty road, and overhead, a deep, bright sky. Pictures like this fill the eye for many hours every day. But even this monotony itself is delightful. We drink in health at every breath. As we ride along through the bracing atmosphere, we are in love with life. Before we weary of the ride, we have entered Gardner Canyon, where the road and river winds between high cliffs. This may be called the outer gateway to the park, and is, in fact, the place where the arriving traveler receives his first hint of the picturesque of the great beyond. On rolls our coach until at last sweeping out upon a spacious plateau, we are whirled rapidly up to the landing stage of the Mammoth Hot Springs Hotel. This hotel is one of a series of five big, I think it's pronounced caravanseries, I've never heard that word before, recently established in the park, not only at the springs, but at the two geyser basins at the lake and at the canyon, the visitor will find excellent hotel accommodations and he need fear no hardships in this much-traveled wilderness. And there's some photos here. And one of the photos is of a gentleman and two women. And the women, of course, they are in long dresses and lots of garments. And let me just tell you, as a woman, having to go on a steamship and a railroad and a horse and buggy, in all of those garments. I would have been so crabby. I'm crabby now if my pants are too tight and I have to drive an hour. <laughs> like, I would not have been a good traveler, especially if I had to be a woman doing the traveling in all of the womanly garments and all of the womanly things we go through. God bless them. I don't know how they did it. Okay, but, but enough of my editorial. We'll keep going. From the wide veranda, I'm sorry, I'm just still laughing over this idea that I would ever do this. I would be like, listen, if we are going to do this, I'm wearing pants. I'm going to be a guy. I'm going to wear pants. I'm not going to wear a bra. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be comfortable. No corset. Forget it. I would have been a very difficult woman to travel with. There would have been nothing graceful about me. Okay, don't you just really want to go on a, a long outward bomb trip with me now? I really just, I don't, I don't want to ever have to do that. So, you know the, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm going off on a tangent. You know those apocalyptic survival movies, like where the aliens come, or there's a comet coming to Earth? I've already said this in a different podcast episode. And people are working so hard to survive, I'd be like, oh yeah, no, uh, no, uh, -uh. I'm just going to stay in my house until the end comes and go home to God. I'm not going to work that hard. So I would not be a good survivalist. I wouldn't care. I would just lay down and say, take me now, God. <laughs> I, I am not at all good friends with discomfort. I know this will come as no surprise to you. That's part of the reason I think why I don't like to travel too much. I ha I'm comfortable here. Why would I ever want to be somewhere where I am not comfortable? I, I don't know. I don't know when I became this version of me, but, but here we are. But, but I love reading other people who do these things. Because then I don't have to. So, so let's keep going. <laughs> 
from the wide veranda. No, I love the idea of a wide veranda. So, so, so that would be good. From the wide veranda, we may see the terraces of the Mammoth Hot Springs, which are the first phenomena presented to the tourists' eyes. Let us at once respond to the attraction of yonder magnet. This is brilliant writing. Let us at once respond to the attraction of yonder magnet and hasten up the snow-white flank of the formation. Brilliant. Formation of what, you ask? That's actually written here. This is not me being snarky. For formation of what, you ask? The answer is formation of formation, for the name formation is applied not only to the wonderful terraced hill built up by action of the springs, but also to the material or deposit of which it is composed. Formation is a word that in time comes trippingly upon the tourist's tongue. But what is formation, we ask the voluble guide, V-O-L-U-B-L-E, voluble. Again, new word. This is great for my vocabulary. Who every day leads scores of visitors across it, and from many points of vantage indicates and describes the thousand and one phenomena that here surprise, delight, and mystify. Formation is simply the, okay, here's a good word, the calcareous, C-A-L-C-A-R-E-O-U-S, which must be a geological term, calcareous material deposited by the overflowing springs whose waters hold in solution carbonate of lime. 200 acres of formation have thus been created. From the valley floor rise terraces on terraces, some of them concealed among the pines far up the mountainside. Three hours scarcely suffice for a mere visit to the wonders grouped at many levels. As many days would not afford an opportunity for a detailed examination of them, as many weeks spent in contemplation of them would not enable the spectator to describe them. They are indescribable. We first make our way over an expanse of snow-white formation. These colorless terraces may be said to be covered with the powdered bones of dead and banished springs. Well, that is very poetic. Where the waters have ceased to flow, all beauty and all color disappear. The first touch of color greets us at the terrace called the narrow gauge. Along its crest, a number of miniature geysers have raised their little cones. Most of them are content merely to boil and simmer, but their laziness is put to shame by the energetic little spout, a tiny eruptive spring known as the baby geyser. It throws a mighty liquid column as fat as a pencil to the astounding height of seven inches. The waters of these springs flow unceasingly down the slope, simultaneously build up and tint the ridge. These waters, however, only apprentices in terrace building and beginners in the art of terrace tinting. They are but neophytes, meekly practicing simple exercises through which in time they will gain the skill required to construct and color palaces like that of the orange geyser, who is a master builder. On a foundation solid, in form and strong in color, rests a superstructure of exquisite daintiness, its overhanging balconies adorned with rich tinted stal stalactites. Stal stalac I know this word. I'm, how do you stal okay. You know the word I'm talking. Stal stalactites. I, I'm probably mispronouncing it. I'm confused because there's an extra T that I don't know where to put it. Pretend I said that word right. Each one of which is shedding pearl liquids. But though we are in midsummer, the trees all around about as if they realized the hopelessness of an attempt to rival this unearthly beauty, put forth no leaves to cover their gaunt nakedness. Beautiful as is this specimen of the water's workmanship, it is comparatively insignificant. This is but a single isolated terrace. It is as nothing when we stand below the veritable mountain where the same phenomena are reproduced in countless numbers. But here the fact 
is vividly impressed upon us that these springs, like mortal men, are subject to the awful law of death. The streams of life are ever changing in their course. Today they are flowing here from terrace to terrace, bowl to bowl, clothing them all with brilliancy and warmth, creating things of beauty to delight a generation. They will in time forsake this slope, and then it, like the one down, which the warm flood coursed in earlier days, will gradually grow white with age, dry with neglect, and finally enfeebled by the alternating shocks of heat and cold, wind and rain, its graceful snow-white death-like forms will crumble to powder to be trampled underfoot by the travelers of future years. But meantime, other beautiful structures will have been created, as we turn our dazzled eyes upon these marvelous productions of an unseen worker, we realize that perennial beauty is destined to reign here, as in the human race, although an impartial providence has decreed that individual loveliness shall be ephemeral. Well, that's beautiful writing. Um, okay, sorry. I, I, that was beautiful. You know, I really encourage you to read out loud at some point because words and sentences, they sound differently when you read them out loud versus when you just glance over them when you're just reading to yourself. Anyways, a little editorial there. So these things attract and charm us just as flowers do because of their freshness and their perishability. Were this pulpit of the gods hewn in solid rock, were its colors applied in some indestructible lacquer, where we assured that in a thousand years it would not change or fade, why half its charm would vanish. Just as the dewdrops on flowers add to their freshness and their charm, so are these forms made lovelier by the waters which clothe every life, every pillar of the colonnade, every curve of the whole structure. A thin veil of water, hot and clear, courses and quick pulsations over the beaded rims and downs these down these tinted pillars until the terrace seems to live. The glorious effect produced by these masterpieces of mineral painting, when they reflect the sunshine through a waving, rippling screen of crystal water, is impossible of pictured reproduction. And yet this phenomenon of terrace building may be easily explained. Nature has furnished here a series of object lessons which, viewed in the light of simple scientific facts, make all the mystery clear. At our feet is a miniature formation where all the details of the grander terraces are minutely reproduced. We see a tiny source of mineral water, a system of little bowls at various levels. Here already the construction of the terrace has begun. The waters, as we know, contain calcareous cal cal matter, I, uh, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right, as the water cools and evaporates, this substance is deposited. Cooling and evaporation naturally take place more rapidly at the outer rims of the bowls, because by the time the water reaches them, the temperature has decreased. Therefore, the deposits at the edge are more quickly made, and thus the rims are gradually built up until the waters are forced to seek another place of overflow and recommence their work elsewhere. It has been estimated that to increase the rim an inch in height, the water labors for a space of 60 days. The tinting is caused by mineral substances brought with the waters from the inner earth. But why seek to explain this seeming miracle? It is enough that after years of toil, the silent forces will produce a thing of such enchanting beauty that man's desire to investigate is lost in ecstasy of admiration. It is enough for us that these yellows, browns, and purples are harmoniously blended, that the still warm pools are bluer than the fairest sky or deepest sea, that every line and curve is to the eye as soft as a caress. It is enough that we have felt the thrill born of the contemplation of the beautiful. What care, care we for calcareous 
oh, this is word is bothering me. Sorry, just pretend I said it right. Deposits, evaporations, sulfur stains, and iron oxides. Away with them. Even Minerva, goddess of wisdom, whose name one terrace bears here, bids us admire rather than seek to understand. Nor is Minerva the only mythical deity honored here. The name of Jupiter, the father of the gods, now dignifies the grandest of the higher terraces. Born in a pool which measures a full hundred feet across, the water of Jove's springs has formed a terrace five acres in extent. Surely the Greeks, had they possessed so wonderful a piece of earth, would not have exiled all their deities to the peaks of barren mountains. This region would have been the thunderer's abode, and that of his innumerable kindred. Now I could lead you on for hours from pool to spring, from terrace to terrace. I could compare the terraces with their broken rainbows to shatter spectra, but all my words would not suggest the half of what one glance reveals. I cannot but say, go thou and see, but do not look for beauty in the full glare of the noon. The visitor who trudges over terraces blinded by the crude light of midday sees nothing but dazzling whites and dingy yellows. The softer light of evening or the glow of sunrise best reveals the beauties of the terraces. We pause to look at a huge cone which is called Liberty Cap. It is the creation of an ancient spring, a spring that was created by building up its crater to such a height that the waters, unable to at last to reach the top and overflow, forsook this stately pile and went to labor at an architectural structure less ambitious. Next morning, and in fact every morning during the season, an animated scene is witnessed at the landing stage of the hotel. Five or six coaches dash up from the huge stables and eager passengers take their places for the long drive of over 160 miles around the park. We cannot but admire the many excellences of the transportation outfit. Splendid Concord coaches, well cared for, solid and comfortable. Horses well groomed and strong. Drivers as skillful as the Western driver needs must be. Okay, so now they're coming through the famous portal known as Golden Gate, and they're not talking about the one in San Francisco. And the title Golden Gate is fitting in a double sense. The rocks are golden, while upon this last mile of road traversed much gold has been expended, and its construction having cost the government no less than $14,000. But the road, alas, is badly engineered. Its grades are steep enough to test the endurance of the strongest horses. Its surface is buried in a small Sahara of shifting sand and dust impalpable as air. Fortunately, a series of showers preceded us and laid the dust along the way. As our coach toils slowly upward, as the murmur of the river grows fainter, as the cliff-like canyon walls draw nearer and nearer to one another, we forget the steep grades of the heavy road in admiration of scenes through which it leads us. We are but four miles from the springs, and yet we are a thousand feet nearer the skies, two thousand feet above the railway terminus, and seven thousand feet above the sea. And presently, the golden portals slowly open, revealing to us a broad valley encircled by mountains and dominated by a cloudland all of silver. Far off we see the Gallatins, a range whose average altitude above the sea is over 10,000 feet, but the great height of the park plateau reduces mountains to mere hills, disappointing the traveler who looks for towering peaks or alpine scenery. The great affinity of the lightning for one of the numerous mountains that surround this plateau led the discoverers to entitle it Electric Peak. It is a sort of giant storage battery. Explorers attempting to attain the summit have been baffled by electric forces, which cause their fingers to prick and tingle and their hair to stand on end. They had indeed a shocking experience. 
but leaving behind this huge laden jar, we approach an hour later a unique feature, a mountain made of glass. That black, glistening mass is vitreous matter, obsidian, or volcanic glass, formed by the rapid cooling of a great wave of lava. Harder than stone, obsidian has long been a favorite material for the weapons of primitive races, and yonder cliff has furnished many countless arrowheads. So, as we drive on, we skirt a number of pretty lakes, and finally at noon, just as the thought of luncheon obtrudes itself, there flash into view the snow-white tents of Larry's famous lunch establishment. Well, that sounds delightful. What traveler does not remember Larry Matthews and his canvas palace? Who can forget his cheery welcome when lifting the ladies from the coach he cries, Glad to see you. Walk right upstairs. Or would ye rather take the elevator? And who can forget the honest Irish face of landlord Larry Matthews? His ready wit is remarkable. Every day he is expected to be funny from 11 to 2 o'clock, during which hours he must not only delight the inbound tourists, but carefully avoid repeating himself in the presence of those outward bound who lunch here for the second time. He's hard to catch, however, for his bright sallies come just as freely as do his smiles. We never know what we are eating at Larry's busy table. He never gives us time to think about the food. He is able to make the people laugh so much and eat so little that the company should meet all his demands for an increase of salary. So, anyways, that's a lovely way to write about somebody. A lady asks for a glass of milk. Drive in the cow, shouts Larry. <laughs> a drink of water, if you please, murmurs a pretty miss, and Larry, with a deep solicitude, inquires, Would you like it hot or cold? I, I don't know why that is funny. And then, if one looks wistfully upon the butter or the sauce, he quickly reassures you with a declaration that there's no, there's no extra charge for flies and dust. Always on the bill of fare, a standing order. All right, well, lunch at Larry's. Again, pictures of men and women, and the women are in so many clothes. All I can just think of is how uncomfortable that must be. The eruption of laughter that occurs every day with the greatest regularity at Larry's certainly causes as much genuine amusement as any of the spoutings of the neighboring geysers. But you know what? That's really nice that they sort of captured this gentleman's essence and gave him due, and all these years later, we are also honoring him. That's really nice. As we ride away from Larry's and the laughter dies away, we begin to hear a roaring as of rushing steam, and presently we are halted by the sentinel of the geyser regions who holds aloft a pillar of hissing vapor to warn us that we are approaching a dangerous ground. We could not, if we would, ignore the black growler whose gruff songs of greeting and farewell will haunt the tourists' memories for years. Day and night, unceasingly, the growler utters his deep, sullen roar. As the other features of the Norris Basin are reproduced on much grander scale elsewhere, we do not linger but we drive on amid the beauties of the Gibbon Canyon, where forest and stream combine to charm the eye. And do you realize the importance of trees and waters of the Yellowstone? The park is a forest-covered region, completely isolated in the midst of a vast tract of treeless deserts. In it, there are no fewer than 36 lakes and 25 waterfalls, while its streams and brooks are numberless. It is a well-known fact that even at this season of low water, this generous region sends forth a refreshing flood into the surrounding parched states. No one can estimate the loss that would ensue should this supply be cut off or diminished, yet the possibility exists. Destroy or permit the destruction of these glorious forests that cover almost nine-tenths of the park, and the land will become a barren waste. These miles and miles and miles of piney growth ensure the life of all the lakes and streams 
by preventing a too rapid melting of the snow and by luring the rain from the vapory clouds. The government has most wisely adopted sufficient measures for the preservation of the park's green mantle. All right, well, that sounds like a really good place to complete. There's lots more here, so perhaps we will come back to this in another episode. But for now, I'm so glad we got to take a journey in the Wayback Machine to how we might have experienced the Yellowstone back in the early 1900s. And I would have had to have been a man then because I just could not have been a woman in all of those clothes. (laughs) That just wouldn't have worked. But luckily, we don't have to know how that would have worked out. We can just virtually go on this adventure through our little phones because we have evolved to 2024 and life is good. So my beautiful friends, I wish you the sweetest of dreams. Thank you for allowing me to keep you company. And I look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you.